All right, our text this morning is Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 is where we will be. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21 through 27 is our, our focus. From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what shall a man be profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall he give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. We're going to begin this morning looking at the situation in which these pivotal verses were written. We see in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has presented himself to the nation, and they have rejected him. And Jesus, in, in the first four verses of uh, Matthew 16, Jesus upbraids them because they can see the, the sky and predict the weather based on their observation of the sky, and yet they cannot see the most basic spiritual signs which are before them. Jesus has come. In verses 5 through 12, Jesus warns them through the illustration of leaven. Now, leaven is a kind of fungus. There's over 1,500 kinds of this particular form of fungus, and it's basically rotting flour, <clears throat> but that fungus from the rotting flour enables bread to rise. But <clears throat> that fungus of leaven is very powerful. So the whole loaf of bread, of raw dough, will be affected by a very small bit of leaven. In the very same way, Jesus is telling them to beware of the error of the teaching of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and the priests, to be careful of them because it will infect the whole group. You know, one of the most important things about us as a church is that we have a pure and uncompromised form of doctrine. There's not really any false teaching in the church, and we've been very careful and very particular about the type of teaching that we allowed to be in the church. And can I tell you, that is a great strength in Hope Baptist Church. The fact that we can preach straight Bible doctrine without concern for what the world or what other churches think. In the pulpit of Hope Baptist Church, there is just straight, pure Bible teaching. Look at verses 11 and 12 of Matthew 16. How is it that you do not understand that I spoke it not to you of concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. You see, they had not made the break yet with their old life. They had their old connections. They still had a connection to those false and dead religious structures that were in front of them. Jesus is presenting himself to them. He is God in the flesh, and he is leading them down a different path. He is leading them out of the, really out of the darkness that they have been in into the light of God's word. They still are not making a complete and clean break, and it is preventing them from entering fully into the life that God has for them. So Jesus is warning them, beware even a little bit of this doctrine that you used to have. It cannot and will not combine with what I am giving you. All it will do is pollute the pure doctrine or Bible teaching that I am giving you. It is so important when we get saved to make a clean break with the false and heretical teachings that we used to hold to. 
So he begins to move and bring them to a, to a very poignant example of this. He begins to bring them right up to the very northern part of Israel, where there is a city that is called Caesarea Philippi. Notice what he says in verse 13 of Matthew 16. When he came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now notice on the map, above and to the west of Israel, there is what we call Lebanon. To the east of Israel, there is Syria. Right up at the very northern part of this, there is the Roman city of Caesarea Philippi. Now Beth and I have been there. I've been there a few times. And it was really a fairly good-sized Roman city, and there are a lot of ruins there. This is, was an important city because it was the center of, a, of, of, of satanic or demonic activity. You see, the Romans had built temples, and these are pictures of the temples that, that were there. That These are the remnants of what is left. And it was around the worship of the god Pan, which was in this cave. Now, Pan is a half-goat, half-man figure, very vile, very dark, very exceptionally wicked. And Jesus stands in front of this cave. He turns his back to it, and he tells his disciples, who do you think that I am? He is doing this in, the, in, the, in, the, in front of the, the, the stronghold of paganism, in front of a stronghold of demonic activity. He's asking them, who am I? And they said, in verse 14, some say thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias or Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said unto them, whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said unto him, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. He says, Simon, or Peter, you are blessed because the Father has revealed this to you. In other words, there is no real virtue in, in what you have done other than the fact that the Father has used you to announce a new dispensation, to announce a new time on the earth. Look what he says in verse number 18. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter is Petros, a pebble. Christ is Petra. He is an immovable rock mountain. He says, Peter, you're just a pebble. It is upon this rock, upon myself, Jesus Christ, I will build the church. He is announcing this new dispensation of which Peter had a very small part. The emphasis here is really on the Father revealing truth. First, that Jesus is the Christ, and then Jesus revealing the church and the new day or the new age that you and I live in. You see, God is going to invest in this church his supreme power, God is going to give to the church the keys to the kingdom of heaven, essentially the gospel truth. The church is going to contain that doctrine or that teaching whereby everybody on the earth can find the Lord Jesus Christ and find out how to be saved. And I will give unto thee the church, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever thou shalt bind on earth, thou shalt be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. From that time forth, Jesus began to show, him, to show unto the disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. In Matthew 16 and verse 21. The chief priests were the um, some of the official leaders, the elders, were the men of substance or importance, the civil leaders, really, in that society. Then you had Pharisees and Sadducees. These are the people who are conspiring to kill the Lord Jesus. And Jesus knows exactly, of course, what will happen, but they are not ready to let go of the world that they live in. 
Jesus is, is, is God in the flesh, and he is among them. And they feel strengthened and comforted by that in their life in this world. But the fact of the matter is, though Peter has so profoundly, through what God has put in his mouth, announced that Jesus is the Christ, and then Jesus has announced that the church will be built, he is still holding on to his life in this world. He still has um, a looking to of his life in this world, and that is opening him up to a demonic control. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be on to thee. The phrase took him refers to a strong action. It's referring to the fact that Peter is grabbing the Lord Jesus and saying, No, Jesus, we will not do this. This is not what is going to be happening. And literally, he is obstructing the will of God in the most pivotal of places. The fact of the matter is, Jesus must suffer the hardship, the betrayals, the, the abuse of the crucifixion. He must be an atonement for sin. But Peter doesn't want to lose him. He likes how life is going with Jesus around. He likes his life in, in this world. He likes the prestige. He likes the situation that he has found himself in. And Jesus, no, don't do that. Jesus, do not upset this situation that I have found myself in. You see, when we get to that position, when we come to that place in our life, we are rebelling against what the Lord is doing in our lives. But notice what Jesus says to Peter here. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus looks right at Peter, and he says, Satan, get behind me. What a profound statement. How can this be? How can Peter who the Father has just used to reveal Christ in such a definitive way, be used so quickly here at Caesarea Philippi to oppose the very work of God in Jesus going to the cross. You see, Jesus recognizes the demonic work that sometimes happens, not only in the world, but in his own people. It's interesting to note in John chapter 6 and verse 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? This he spake of Judas Icariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. And the Bible says in the upper room that when um, Judas turned away, the devil entered into him. Peter himself, who, who, who said such an awful thing to the Lord Jesus, later in his life, in the epistle that he wrote, he said, be sober or be clear-minded and be vigilant or strong because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's telling us later, Satan is seeking believers to devour. He is seeking to control them. He is seeking to use them inside of their local New Testament churches, inside of their families to oppose God's will, to oppose what God is doing, can I tell you this happens? There are parents that have raised their children for God, and God is beginning to do a very special work in their life, and yet rather give their children to God, they pull them back because they recognize what money they could make, what prestige they could have in this world. And they discourage their children from serving God full-time as a pastor or a pastor's wife or a missionary or being very active in the church. I'm just saying that if we love this world and we love the things that are in this world, my friend, we could be used like Peter was used to obstruct the things of God. Now, that word savorist is an interesting word, and it means the characteristic way that you think or the bend of your mind, what it is that you're inclined to seek. And the fact of the matter is, Peter was inclined to have the prestige of this world, the position and the power of this world. My friend, when we are inclined to this life, 
when we are consumed with what this life has to offer us, what this life can bring to us, when that is the motive, when that is what we are living for, even though we are perhaps coming to church and and somewhat active in church, but that's not really where our heart lies. My friend, we are susceptible to a demonic work in our life. And that's the point that Jesus is making here. Look with me in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 19. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 19. I'll put it on the screen here. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. In other words, do not let that be your mind. Do not let that be the direction of your heart. It means to lay up means to amass treasure and position and, 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 and stuff. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust are corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. It is a common thing that Jesus says. He says this repeatedly over and over in different ways. He says, do not let your heart be inclined to finding the value that only God can give you, to finding the things that only God can give you in this world. And the reason is because it won't last. It'll be stolen. It'll corrupt. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Let that be the motive. Let that be the guiding principle in your life, laying up treasure in heaven. He begins to show A very important principle in verse number 21, he says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And what he means simply is this, that whatever you have set your heart on, that is where your reward is going to be. If your heart is set upon this world, that's the reward that you're going to have. It's what you get in this life. And you are going to forfeit the reward that God has for you You see, the danger here is, and what Jesus is bringing out, is there is no way to straddle both. And this is so important. There is no way that I can have the appearance of being a Christian, that I can have the appearance of being a spiritual person, and at the same time, my heart is really yearning for more of this life, for more of what this life can give me, what this life can bring to me, there is, that, that is an impossibility. If I am yearning for that, then I have forfeited reward in heaven. And if I am living for the reward that I have in heaven, then I have forfeited a definite part of my life on this earth. We're forfeiting one or the other, but we are never, ever, ever accumulating both. Notice what he says in verse 22. He says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore in that eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. The eye is what is being looked to. That is what is being seen. It refers to direction or motive. He says, if your eye is on the kingdom of God, if your eye is on the reward that God is bringing you, it will give light to your whole body person. It will fill you with the truth of God, the wisdom of God. It will be transformational in your life. But if the light that is within you is actually darkness, but if thine eye be evil, that literally means to be filled with misery and corruption and ruin. It is a picture of someone that is looking to their life in in this world, that is seeking from this world, the value that is seeking the the reward in what they get from men and what they can do through their flesh. If thine eye is evil, the whole body shall be filled with darkness. If therefore the light that is in there be darkness, how great is that darkness? And this explains why sometimes Christians become so carnal. The light that is in them is actually darkness and they are living for this life and the things of heaven mean so little to them it it, it has become so small to them it is so sad the light that is in them is actually darkness Jesus makes a very strong point in verse number 24 he says 
Don't ever try and do both. Don't ever try and accumulate. Do not ever try and gain the reward in this life because you will most certainly be a servant of that. That is most certainly where your reward will be. It is going to be decisive. Either my reward is in this life or my reward is in heaven. But it is not in both places. It is never in both places. Look what he says. No man can serve two masters. It is an impossibility, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is a representation of what this world offers, of its pleasure, of its material wealth, of the prestige from having things and possessions. We cannot live for this life, for the things in this life, and have the reward that God wants to give us. That's why Peter said, don't go to the cross. Don't leave us. Jesus, things are getting good. You are immensely popular, powerful, wise, and wonderful. And life is good while you are around us. It was a carnal mind that he was trying to reconcile with the spiritual work that God was doing, and it was not working. My friend, it is a probing picture for each one of our lives. The fact of the matter is, not only could we be cool to the work of God, we could actually be used to obstruct or hinder the work of God by that emphasis that we have placed upon this world. It, it opens us up to a certain demonic control when that is where our heart is and that it is what it is that we are living for. There are two kingdoms. God is infinitely holy and has the power and the strength that we need to live this Christian life. And he is saying that we most definitely and certainly must live for that kingdom. So there is a realization that we have made through a life, a love of this life in this world, Satan seduces believers. Now there is an action that we must take. And that means we must embrace the hardship and the loss to our life in this world in order to fulfill God's will, to obey him, and to have the reward that he has for us. I want you to notice in verse 24 of Matthew 16. Verse 24 of Matthew 16. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. So essentially, we are seeing here that we must embrace the loss in this life that following Jesus brings us. We must allow that there is going to be some loss. We cannot believe the lie that we can have it all. All that is in this life, all this world has to offer us, and be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. It cannot happen. It will never happen. And Jesus is calling us to consider the cost of genuine discipleship, to consider the cost of what it means to be a true follower of him. And he lists three things that must be in our life if we are going to follow him. First of all, there must be a denying of our carnal desires, of selfishness, the desire to be recognized, the desire to accumulate position and power. Now, if God honors us with certain roles, um, it won't be something that goes to our head. It won't be something that we were seeking. It, is, it would be a role that we would be using responsibly for his glory. But there's a different kind of seeking for power and prestige in the church and in the world which is around us where people want standing they want, they do what they do in order to be recognized by other people. And he's telling us there must be a decisive turning. We must be willing to deny ourselves certain things. If we are going to pursue the will of God, there must be certain things that we are willing to let go of so that we can follow him. 
Sometimes we see people so caught up in social media. Sometimes we people see people so caught up in different events that are bringing a certain credit or recognition to themselves. Sometimes we see people so caught up in working to accumulate a house or to accumulate a car or to accumulate all of these different things. And a house and a car is not wrong. And I'm not saying they're wrong, but when that is the mode of an ambition and the thought within our house and my, my heart is, when I have this car, when I have this house, when I have this situation, and that is really what we're living for, that's really where the bend of our heart is. My friend, there has to be a sense of recognizing that sometimes when I follow Jesus Christ, there is going to be a sense of loss in my life. I'm going to have to allow myself to be denied certain things if I'm ever going to have a ministry in the church, if I'm ever going to have the time to serve him, if I'm ever going to have the resources to serve him, if I'm ever going to have the energy to serve him, I must deny, there must be a certain denial of other things in this life. There are other things that I cannot fully give myself to, that I cannot spend resources on, that I cannot be involved in because it would inhibit or hold back my ability to serve him. He speaks secondly of the cross, literally of being willing to openly endure hardship. He used a similar verse in six chapters earlier in Matthew 10 and verse 37. He said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now notice, he never says loving your mom or dad or loving your kids is wrong, but loving them more than him, loving them more than the Jesus Christ is wrong. And he says, and he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. You see, when somebody was condemned, the worst and poorest of the criminals, they would be drawn through the streets carrying their cross. Sometimes they would be ripped apart by the mobs along the way. But they were carrying the instrument of their death. And it's a picture to you and I that as we go through life, we are willing to bear the hardship. We are willing to bear the abuses of being a Christian. We are willing to open our mouths and communicate gospel truths to those who are around us, even though we may be misunderstood or pilloried or slandered through because we are communicating the gospel message. We will bear that cross. We will carry what it is that we must carry. We will do whatever it is that we must do to stay true to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, getting saved means the ruin, really, of your life in many ways in this world. It means that everything changed, that you have a new direction and you have a new bend. And I'm not saying that God makes your life miserable or that your life is terrible. God blesses and he brings goodness into our life and he, and he ritually rewards us in this life. But I'm saying unequivocally that God changed us when he saved us and he gave us a new destiny and he placed us in a new kingdom and our relationship to the world and our relationship to, this, to, this, to the old life has been forever and irrevocably changed. And if I am going to be part of his kingdom, I must bear that cross. I must walk that journey, no matter what it costs me, no matter how difficult it may be. And finally, I must have a consuming desire to know Jesus Christ. It must be a personal thing with you and I, that I love him, that Jesus Christ is the center of my life, that, indwell, that abiding with him, whereby he indwells me through the power of the Holy Spirit, whereby I have this close relationship with him. I love him. I know him and have, and have known by him. And I walk with him. And I, and I have this relationship where I am continually becoming more like him in heart and attitude. 
And my approach to this life is more and more separated from this life and the pleasures and values and statements and ethoses of this life mean less and less to me. And his kingdom means more and more to me. And his work and his will and his way is what consumes me. William Whiting Boarding was born into a very wealthy family. Um, his, his family would, in today's um, dollars, perhaps be billionaires. He was um, an exceptionally wealthy family in Chicago. His mother went to a gospel preaching church um, in the late 1800s and actually was saved. And um, she brought her son, William, to the church, and he too was born again. And when he got saved, he began to grow. He immediately started reading his Bible, witnessing to people around him, developing a rich prayer life. When he was 16, his wealthy parents sent him on a cruise around the world, and it was there that he realized that God was calling him to be a, a missionary. And he began to prepare for that. He went to Yale University. It's interesting to note at that time, Yale was not overrun with atheism. It was not overrun with secularism like it is today. Some of the finest Ivy League colleges in the United States were actually Bible preaching, Bible um, pastor training places in the years gone by. He entered Yale in 1905. He started daily prayer groups. He was immensely popular. He was just a unique guy. He was intelligent. He was hardworking, uh, incredible leadership skills. He, he was just beloved by staff and students all around him. Of his own money, he started a rescue mission, and uh, there were a lot of African Americans in that rescue mission, and he worked with them and loved them and, and sought to see them saved and grounded in the truths of God's word. He was a leader in several large Christian projects, but eventually he felt the need to go to the Uyghur Muslims in northwest China. Perhaps you've heard about them. They're sort of very persecuted people in China. He first decided to study Islam um, <coughs> in Arabic in Cairo. So he boarded with a uh, Syrian family there, and eventually he caught cerebral meningitis and died a few weeks later in March of 1913. He was only 25 years old. And it looks like, what a waste. This guy who has had such incredible potential, wasted, dead at 25, there in Egypt. Following his death, his mother found in his Bible the words, no reserve. And there was a date suggesting it had been shortly, written shortly after he renounced his fortune in favor of missions. He said, I don't want the money. I don't want the position. I want you, Jesus, and I want your will for my life. He renounced his fortune and enlisted as a missionary to the Muslims in China. Later, he is said to have wrote, no retreat, because his father made a demand on him that if he would not enter into the family business, he would forsake whatever reward that would bring to him. He would not go back into the family position. He could not deny the call of God upon his life. He must go forward. And finally, before he died in Egypt, he, he added the final phrase in the back of his Bible, no regrets. I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry that I have said no to this life. I am not sorry that I have said no to what everybody else says is valuable, to what everybody else says you must have. I'm not sorry that I said it doesn't matter. It doesn't have any real value. It is Jesus Christ and the reward that he has for me, the work that he has given me to do, that is what consumes me. And if my life is ended quickly, if I die an early death because of that, so be it. So be it. So be it. It is his will. And I know that I will never achieve his will without first dying to myself. The fact of the matter is, 
We cannot be consumed with our selfish agenda, bent on having more and more stuff, bent on find, consumed with making ourselves happy and contented in this life and have the richness of the life that God has for us. If I am going to have the richness and the reward of that life, my friend, it means that there is going to be a certain sense of denial in this life. There is going to be a certain cross that must be born and a relationship with Jesus Christ that must be had. We have to acknowledge we cannot have it all. That we cannot have everything this life offers. We cannot have all the rewards of this life and have the reward that God has prepared for us. It simply is an impossibility. We cannot have it all. We must choose which kingdom we are going to pursue. We must choose which kingdom our heart is going to be inclined towards. And finally, God gives us a motivation for this. And the motivation is that the reward Jesus gives is infinitely better than any reward that we will find in this life. In verse 26 of Matthew 16, he says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, perhaps you're seeing that phrase, lose his own soul, and you're, reading, you're wondering whether he's talking about losing your salvation. He is not. The word soul here is the exact same word that is translated life in the previous verse, in verse number 25. It is not referring to your eternal state. It is referring to your life, the condition of your heart in this life. If our soul is bent on this life and obtaining from this life and achieving in this life, it means we will forfeit the reward that God has for us in eternity. We will forfeit the work that God wants to do through us in this life, we will forfeit. So the truth of the matter is, there is a reward that is infinitely better than anything this life can give us. To make this more clear, let's go to Luke chapter 9 and verse number 24 and 25. It says, whosoever will save his life will lose it. Whosoever will seek to preserve his life in this, his life in this world will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life, will embrace the denial, the sense of loss in this life, they will gain it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and, and lose himself or be cast away? That The alternate verse is lose his soul. It's talking about himself, losing what God could do or through his life and be a castaway essentially in heaven. What, did, what are we advantaged if we gain everything in this world but have no standing, no position in the kingdom of God, that we have no real reward in heaven, that there is nothing that we can say we did with our life that advanced the kingdom of God and moved the kingdom of God forward? If we gain the whole world, so what? If we are a castaway in the kingdom of God, his point is simply this. His reward is so superior that anything we do to, that, to um, forfeit that reward is a complete and total loss in our life. My friend, the fact of the matter is Jesus has a reward that is eternal. Jesus has a reward that never corrupts, that never weakens, that is never lost. The reward that he has for us is of a different character. It is of a different substance. It is of a different power. It is a reward that he has given us. And it is a reward that we will enjoy and know through all of eternity. That is the reward that God gives to us. Whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? And then he says, in Luke 9 and verse 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of his holy, holy angels. A very powerful thing is being presented here. And Jesus is saying is if we are ashamed of him, 
that we are too ashamed to be identified as a Christian at work, if we are too ashamed to be identified as a Christian among our neighbors because we want our standing in this world, if we are too ashamed to acknowledge that we are a Christian, then we have lost our reward. But not only that, Jesus flips it. And he says, if you are so ashamed of me that you pursued this world and, and, and found it to be humiliating to be known as a Christian or to be associated as a Christian, if that's how you feel and if that's how you think, you're, going not, you're not going to have the right reward in heaven. And in heaven, it's going to be reversed. And there will be a sense of shame and a sense of humiliation in heaven. Though you are saved and though you are redeemed and bought by the blood of the Lamb, you'll be standing there, in a sense, to speak, to speak metaphorically, naked. You won't have the reward. You won't have the blessing. The work of God that could have been done through you is not done through you. And you have nothing in heaven. Other, uh, you are saved, but have lost so much. Jesus speaks of this in the book of Revelation chapter 3. And he says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And what he's saying here is how revolting he finds it for Christians to try and act like they are spiritual, to try and act like they truly love the world, but really they have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and they're just lukewarm. If they were in the world, they could be rebuked and turned back to God. And if they had their, but their, their selves in the will of God and in the work of God, then God could commend them and reward them. They're just this disgusting, lukewarm. So he says to them in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Do you see? It's a picture of us in this world where we have achieved the things that we want in this world and we now have the positions of status. We now have the toys. We now have the stuff. And we say, I am rich and increased with goods and I don't need anything. And church is just something that helps sweeten life and it just helps me to get through it a little bit better. But in God's eyes, he's saying we are wretched we are miserable, we are poor and blind and naked. It's a powerful statement about where we stand in his sight when we are trying to straddle both kingdoms, when we are trying to live for both kingdoms. He says in verse number 18, powerful verse, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You know what he's talking about there is the reward that you achieved through your willingness to live solely for him, even though it cost you greatly in this life, even though there was an incredible suffering or perhaps persecution, you lived for him, you served him, you pushed his kingdom forward, you did what he wanted you to do. Notice what he says. Buy that gold, tried in the fire, that in my kingdom, he's talking about, you might be rich and clothed with white raiment, as contrasted with nakedness, you are clothed with this beautiful, these beautiful garments of purity, and that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. My friend, there is a day that is coming when Jesus is coming back for you, and he is coming back for me, and let us never mistake it. That day is a day of reward. It is a day of honoring. It is a day of respect. It is a day where God will reveal things. And in that day, we want to have that reward. And we must understand that we will never have that reward without denial and without cross-bearing and without genuine seeking of the Lord Jesus Christ. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. 
He goes on to say in John 3. So in conclusion, I want to read you a verse that is a contrast to the verses we've read in John 16. And it's in Colossians chapter 1 and verse Chapter 3 and verse number 1, excuse me. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is at the right hand of God. And it's a contrast between the savoring of the things of men that Satan was using in the heart of Peter with the seeking of those things which are above. And he says, Do not allow yourself to be living for and serving the things in this life, in this world, that is not going to satisfy you. That is going to strip you of the excellence of God's work. It is going to strip you of the reward that God has for you. If you are risen with Christ, if you are redeemed, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Notice what he says. Set your affection on things above and not on the things of the earth. Literally, set your heart, set your mind, not on the things of men, not on the things of the world, but on the things of God. Let that be the bend of your heart. Let that be the direction of your heart. Let that be what consumes you day by day. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, my friend. Is that a picture of our lives? Is our affection set on the things above, on the things that God has for us, that God wants to do through us, on fulfilling his purpose for our life so that we're willing to be denied in this life, we're willing to bear crosses in this life? He goes on to say, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. It is always the same. It's amazing, the consistency of the Bible. It is always realize that you have a reward. And someday Jesus is coming, and Jesus is going to give that reward to you. That's why you should set your affection on things above. That's reality. That's the real world. And we must set our heart on things above. Because Christ is coming and we will appear with him in glory. And we don't want to be blind and miserable and naked without reward, without blessing at that point. I want to go back again to Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. And I want to show you really quick something that he says. And he said unto them, If any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Notice, it is not a momentary surrender. It is not a one-time surrender. It is not necessarily a one-time place of crisis. It is every day choosing to be the person that God wants you to be living the life that God wants you to live, living true to him, fulfilling his will for your life every week, every day that you are living for his kingdom, not consumed with media or social media, not consumed with what everybody else says is of value and everybody else says you should have and and, and to have the standing and praise of men. No, my friend, he's saying Take up your cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life, the same shall save it. Do we realize that we are dying to live? That truly we are dying in order to live. And without dying, there is no living. Without the death to self, Without the forsaking of our life in this world, we will never have the life that God has for us. So by way of review, I want you to notice with me really quick that through a love of this life, we are opened up to a, to a demonic twisting. We can be seduced and we could actually, through our love of the life of this world, through living in that kingdom, we could actually obstruct the work of God in our own home, um, among our friends, in our church. It can happen. Secondly, 
embrace the hardship of loss in this life in order to gain a heavenly reward. Realize that if you are going to have that reward that God has for you, it is going to cost you in this life. And if we are so set on having everything that this life can give us and maximizing our life in this world, we will forfeit the reward. We will forfeit the work that God could do in and through our life. We must embrace the denial that the will of God will sometimes bring us, will oftentimes bring us. We must embrace that hardship in order to gain his reward. And the motivation for this simply is the reward that he brings is so much better than the, than the very best. If we had everything this, this life offers, everything that this life could possibly give us, it would be in, infinitesimally small compared to the reward that Jesus Christ gives, the reward that he brings to our life on this earth, but also, and especially, the reward that he gives us in his kingdom. And that's the reward that we want to have. So I pray, my friend, it would encourage you, as this message has really worked on my heart and encouraged me to become every day dead to my life in this world so that I might be alive to the work that he is doing in and through me. Through dying, we live. I'm going to have a moment of quietness here, and I just pray that you and I will just get quiet and uh, uh, allow God to speak to our heart and bring conviction to our life. And I know I've been greatly convicted uh, by this message and greatly helped and strengthened. And I pray that you'll realize that every day, that if you are going to achieve what God wants you to achieve, if you are going to have the place in this life that he wants you to have, there must be a denial. There must be a cross-bearing in our life. It is only through that dying that we will achieve the reward that he has for us. My friend, that is the reward that is truly worth having. Let's have a moment of quietness to consider this truth and then a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the truth that you have given. And Father, may this not just be truths that we are familiar with. Maybe they be truths that live within us. Help us to know each and every day that we must die to ourselves. We must take up our cross if we are going to find the life and the reward that you have for us. In Jesus' name.